This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Happy New Year to you from the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster. And a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDV FM radio. It is January 3rd and it is still Christmas. As I reminded you last week, the season of Christmas lasts 12 days. So we have until this Tuesday, January 5th, to keep celebrating the birth of Christ. And as we begin this new year, we will be repeating our flower dedications from last year until such time that we are actually ordering flowers for the chancel. So today's flower dedications are given to the glory of God in memory of Roger Sachs by Don Sachs and by the Derm Obsession family to wish everyone a happy Armenian Christmas, which will be January 6th. We have prayer requests today. We pray for Marie, who is under quarantine at Anne's Choice, and for Marie's friend, Carolyn, who has been in the hospital with pneumonia. And we have prayers of thanksgiving to offer to God today for the birth of two grandchildren to members of this congregation back in November, Charlotte and Ray welcomed their new granddaughter, Chloe Athena, and Patty and Craig celebrate the birth of their first grandchild. Hudson Wyatt Nani was born on December 29th to their daughter, Kelsey, and her husband, Mike. Congratulations to both families. Today's liturgists are Cindy, Carol, and Zach. And our musical gifts are offered by Kathy worth Balkus on organ and piano. And our hymn singers are Joan, Linda H., Sue G., Jonna, Jenny, and Cindy, conducted by our director of music, Dave Sathra. Today, we will celebrate communion with the Reverend Dr. Keith Lawrence presiding at the Lord's table, along with your fellow participants, Elaine, John, Barbara, Joan, Linda R., Peggy, Walt, Carol, and myself. So please have something to eat and drink with you so that we can all partake together. If you belong to another Christian tradition, please know that you are welcome to join us in this sacrament. We begin our worship with the sounding of the chimes. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory. Alleluia. Our worship continues with the morning prelude.
Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Almighty God, you have shed on us the light of your word made flesh. May your light kindle in our hearts and shine forth through our lives in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the light of the world. Amen. Our first lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water, in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty says the Lord. Our New Testament reading is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. We will be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, 
and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his people and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as I thoroughly enjoy mentioning every chance I get, we are still in the Christmas season through January 5th, because according to the church calendar, the season lasts 12 days. So today is the 10th day of Christmas. So good luck to anyone out there looking for 10 Lords of Leaping to give to your true love. But wait, there's more good news. As the flower dedication from the Derma Session family reminds us, there are other Christian traditions that celebrate Christmas not on December 25th, but on January 6th. So if you really love Christmas and want to keep your decorations up, then by all means embrace both traditions and extend the festivities. Now, it's important for us to remember that Christmas lasts longer than one day, because we all know that one day is not enough time to give thanks for how God's love became real and tangible in the incarnation of Jesus. Now, every year we hear Luke's gospel tell the story of the incarnation with a sensory feast of sights and sounds we can practically see with our own eyes shepherds and angels and hear with our own ears songs of praise pour forth from Mary's lips and from the skies over Bethlehem. And those of you who are familiar with rural life might even hear the bleeding of sheep whenever you hear Luke's story. And anyone who's held a newborn baby can imagine how profound an event this is that almighty God would choose to manifest divine power by coming to us as a helpless infant. Luke leaves us with such an indelible imprint of the birth of Christ that not only can we imagine ourselves there at the manger, but we can feel God here with us. Christmas isn't Christmas without Luke's story. And the same is true for today's lesson from John. Christmas isn't Christmas without hearing John's grand overture to his gospel with its cosmic portrait of the eternal word becoming flesh 
and living among us. It catapults us beyond this world into eternity itself, suspending us outside of time and confronting us not with the details of Christ's birth within history as Luke does, but by claiming that Jesus shares the same timeless essence of God as creator, light, life, grace, glory, and truth. But I have to admit that I have a harder time getting my arms around the beginning of John's gospel than I do Luke's story of the nativity. No doubt, John's version of the incarnation is beautiful and poetic. In fact, it's widely believed that it was written to be used in worship as a hymn or as a form of liturgy. Yet still, it's much harder to imagine, much less visualize John's words compared with hearing about shepherds surrounding the baby lying in a manger. What would it look like to present John's version during Bethlehem Village? What costumes would we wear? How would we act out in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God? While it's true that Luke and John give us two very different perspectives of the incarnation, we should be careful not to read Luke as if he's only interested in the earthly humanity of Jesus, and then to read John as if he's only interested in Jesus's otherworldly divinity, because it's a mistake to read either gospel that way. The last thing John would want is for us to read his gospel as a spiritual abstraction of the incarnation. And the last thing Luke would want is for us to see the birth of Christ as something God decides to do on a whim, as a last minute decision on how to deal with us. Both gospels go on to proclaim that through the flesh and blood, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God's self-giving love doesn't signal a change of heart in the divine nature, but reveals who God always has been and how God always has acted toward us, even since before the world was made. So both Luke and John give the same purpose for the gift of the incarnation. And that purpose is that if we want to see the invisible God, all we need to do is look at Jesus. And if we want to see the humanity that God created us to be, all we need to do is look at Jesus. A bishop from the second century named Arrhenius once wrote that the glory of God is the human person fully alive and life consists in beholding God. John's overture to his gospel makes that point clearly and succinctly. It begins with Christ in eternity, but then quickly comes down to earth to where he shares our embodied existence, not merely for the sake of identifying with us, but to show us what it means to be truly human and fully alive to God. And receiving that life makes us children of God. Now, each of us isn't called to be a child of God on one's own, but together as the church, as the body of Christ. 
And just as Jesus brings the word of God to life in his flesh, the church is called to embody the word as well, not just to hear it in worship or to talk about it in Bible study, but to go out and live it, to conform our lives to the word and to give it shape until others can see it and touch it and recognize its source especially in a world where darkness appears to be having its own way. And as these 12 days of Christmas draw to a close, and with Lent only six and a half weeks away, now is the perfect time to reflect on the word made flesh, and then to ask ourselves and each other, how might we embody that life? How open are we to receiving grace upon grace? And how excited are we to be called children of God? We don't have to wait for extraordinary opportunities to put flesh on our faith. We don't have to have a sudden spiritual awakening in order to live fully alive to God. You and I are called to enliven the word right where we are with what we have. We're called to live the truth in our communities and to bear the light to our neighbors. And we can expect to receive grace upon grace each moment of each day and in every circumstance, both the ordinary and the extraordinary. Because the word did not remain aloof from everyday life, lived by ordinary people in this world. He became flesh and he lives among us. Thanks be to God.
north and south and east and west, Jesus calls us to come sit at his table and receive a foretaste of the kingdom of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Your slaves in Egypt, and you freed us. We were hungry and thirsty in the wilderness, and you nourished us with manna and water from the rock. We had no home, and you led us into the land of your promise. We worshiped idols of our own making, and you called us through the prophets to turn back to you. At last, you emptied yourself of power and came to us as a child of Mary, holy God in frail and human flesh. You are holy, O God of power and might, and blessed is Jesus Christ, the one who comes in your name. In his life, he called unlikely people to follow him, fishermen, tax collectors, children, sinners, outcasts, deniers, and betrayers. On the cross, he gave himself up to the powers of the world, showing in his body the mystery of your love. By this very cross, you have undone and remade the wisdom of this world, drawing light from darkness, power from weakness, life from death. Pour out your life-giving spirit upon these earthly gifts of bread and wine and make us into one body with Christ that we who are baptized into his death may walk in newness of life. We praise you, O oh God, blessed Trinity. And we pray to you the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his rest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life, take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The cup of salvation, drink of it, all of you. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament, you have given us your son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
north and south and east and west. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.